Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks for being on time and being a bit patient. This is our inaugural seminar of the term, so technical difficulties, um, one of which being that our presenter is currently rushing over here from a delayed train. So I'll make an introduction. By the time I wrap up, Amin will be here to join us. So to begin, thanks a lot for joining the Martin Center seminar series. This is a series that the Department of Architecture at the University of Cambridge has run for 54 years now, which makes it one of the longest enduring series in the profession, um, something we're rather proud of. This edition, our theme is on forms of dialogue, which we interpret rather loosely, but I'll describe it by saying that architecture succeeds or fails based on how it communicates, from how a project is drawn and presented to a client to the tone of consultations with communities, from how materials speak to each other right through to how building systems speak to occupiers. It is less and less the product of one voice and increasingly an outcome of dialogue between many. This dialogue bounces back and forth between humans, practitioners and researchers, designers and makers, but it also occurs between us and our environment and between the natural world and the built world. Further complicating this cacophony is the dialogue between architecture and the nebulous digital systems that continue to infuse our design environment. All of these interactions and exchanges are fundamental to the shape and relevance of the built outcome, and therefore the form of these dialogues is critical in shaping a more coherent, caring, inclusive, responsible architecture. Thus, this series will invite both researchers and practitioners whose work deals with the interactions and interchanges to speak on this aspect of their work, from the community conscious commons to the cybernetic design philosophy and the climate potential of artificial intelligence. All are welcome, so please continue to come to these seminars and enjoy the conversation. We have both an in-person audience as well as a virtual audience today. Um, I think we've, we're starting enough on time. We should have plenty of time left as well for a Q&A session afterwards. So Amin will speak for 45 minutes to an hour, and then we'll have approximately 15 minutes to half an hour for Q&A. Once we arrive at that point, I will inform the online audience how you can pose your questions. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I should mention that my name is Michael Salka. I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Cambridge along with Sam Atkinhead, who just left the room, and Hamide here. We are coordinating this 54th edition. Um, but that's enough, I think, about the background of the seminar series. I'll now briefly introduce Amin, who has kindly volunteered his time to speak with us today, and then I'll hand over the microphone. So Amin was born in Berlin. He studied at the University of Edinburgh and is now settled in London, where he is the current chairperson of group work, an employee ownership trust of architects. He's an assistant lecturer at the Royal College of Art, as well as visiting tutor at Harvard, trustee of the Sir John Sohn Museum, and chair of the Sohn Medal. Completed works by the practice have been twice shortlisted for the Reba Sterling Prize, noted for their poetic outcomes while always tackling ethical questions. Today, Amin is going to present on the measure of architecture, which involves a brief introduction to Vasari and Winkelmann, and will explain the late 18th century loss and separation of knowledge and material technologies and arguably ethics from drawing and aesthetics in architecture. The resultant and perennial questions of architectural styles began a generation later during the 19th century by Boricher and Semper in their search for meaning behind beautiful facades. The Homo Faber sent its craftsmen linked to Protagoras, for whom the title is badly paraphrased, but whose ethical framework, with a question mark, I think Amin will answer that for us, given his 45 minutes, at least beginning with climate change. Both research and build examples using EN15978 as a guide to substitute high and low embodied carbon materials in operation. Optimistically, taking construction from a 40% contributor of atmospheric carbon to a sequestration industry. And Amin's talk will highlight how these elements all fit together. So that being said, thank you again for joining. I'll hand the microphone now to Amin. Uh, again, we'll arrive at the Q&A after the talk. Thanks, Michael. Okay, sorry for arriving late. Um, so I've split the talk into two, two parts. Uh, the, um, the first part is um, on the memory stick. So we can either... Start, I can start with this one. And, uh, do it in reverse. Let's see, I think... Uh, easy enough to get <coughs> if you know which file I'm using. Yeah, reverse memory. <laughs> Look the other way around. Uh, oh God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, also the computer. Thing, but also. <coughs> Let's make sure we're sharing our screen for our online. 
I could call them to open up the other one afterwards. Seminars, are you allowed to talk back? Are we allowed to make conversational? Or do you want to sit there passively all the way to the end? So if I ask things like, you know, Carl Frieda Schinkel, you'll nod your head and say, yes, I know. Please feel free to interrupt. Um, <coughs> occasionally I, I, on these talks, I reference somebody called Professor Michael Rummage, who I've never met. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's here. I can't see him. I, I joke, the last time I joked with um, Michael, that one day, if any of you remember um, Annie Hall, the, um, the queue to the cinema scene, when um, <laughs> I'm, I'm expecting somebody to pull him out and, um, and say, no, that's not what I meant at all. Right, okay, let's start. Is this actually full screen or? Yeah. It is. All right, fine. So this is Schinkel. I can't read a Schinkel. Um, uh, grew up, was educated in, in the Enlightenment period and believed that the neoclassical was, <clears throat> was the key, the future as it were to architecture, as everybody did at that time. And he obviously became most excellent at it. Uh, uh, great uh, self-publicist, uh, was convinced that was it. That was the future was the neoclassical until he, he did a <coughs> toward Britain. And he, he ostensibly came just to visit the British Museum as it was going up because he was obviously working on the museum in, in Berlin, but then um, toured Britain, so that's England, Scotland, and Wales, uh, 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 as it was industrialising with the Prussian um, consul. This is really to discover how is England became so powerful, how it became so wealthy, uh, uh, studied industrialization. So that's buildings, it's industry. And uh, he was quite shocked. He came back to Berlin and said, I don't understand it. This, this, apart from the industrialization. The buildings, the factories, the warehouses, the bridges, the entire infrastructure that's being built, there's no reference to the neoclassical. It's just going up. Uh, and these are buildings that are formed, obviously, of a new age, a new industrial age. Perhaps a point of crisis. He asks, uh, he's all quite old by this stage in his career as well as age. And uh, uh, he asks a young Karl Bertiger, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of him when he was younger, at the top there, to, to investigate. What, what is the, what have I been doing? What is this neoclassical language that I've been playing with uh, all my life? Um, and it seems to have no relevance to this future, this future industrial age. Uh, Karl Bertiger's student, um, or takes, the, takes Karl Bertiger's uh, work a bit further, is obviously Gottfried Semper. Karl Bertiger effectively terms the, the coins, the phrase tectonic, the assembly of, of, of your materials uh, 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 perhaps in what we might call articulated structure, so their expression. Semper then takes that further and um, helps define Karl Bertiger's definition of what is structure, the can form, and what is uh, the, the facade that is emblematic of that structure that becomes um, emblematic to a particular culture, the Kunst form. Uh, 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 essentially saying the materials that we have at hand, the way we decide how they're joined and bound become complete, they complete the culture ultimately. What is the future? What is the future for this industrial age? Now, you have to remember the education system at that time is still a drawing, sitting in a, in, as pupillage in semi-academies, drawing, 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 the neoclassical age, uh, but what could it be? And obviously Britain's industrializing before the rest of um, Europe. And we're already having our crisis about it, industrialization, and we've got Morris and Luskin um, challenging that. The sort of medievalism eventually becomes uh, the arts and crafts, crosses the channel as the Werkbund. So the Werkbund is the same as the arts and crafts. It's got a social mission um, against the industrialization of people sitting in factories, but actually working with their hands. And surely this will bring us a new architecture that's representative of the industrial age. We forget that actually, um, not sure if we've got no, no, no. we forget that um, uh, Henri van der Velde actually founded the Bauhaus. So he was Belgian, but it was after the First World War. And of course, mm -hmm. Belgium couldn't run and beat uh, the, the head of the Bauhaus. So he recommended uh, Gropius. It was very arts and crafts originally, and still had its um, very, um, what, we, what you know, William Morris unashamedly called socialist mission. 
uh, which the Bauhaus retained, but they quickly dropped the arts and crafts um, uh, sort of lyrical styles, as it were, and went stripped down. And we know that it became emblematic, not just in, in the building form, but obviously in their furniture. Uh, and that's really a hundred years after Bertiger, Semper, even uh, Schenkel were asking the question, what is the architectural language of, um, of the industrial age? Exactly at the same time, we have um, art, art uh, sorry, uh, literature, uh, uh, lecturers, um, um, Frederica de Onis uh, in, in, um, in Madrid and in Barcelona, teaching people like um, Lorca, well, Dali, that actually, uh, why are we still talking about modernism or the capital M? Surely we're in a post-modern age, post-industrial age. Um, surely we should be, and this is, you know, you can, you can sort of understand it's in Spain. Spain has a fantastic um, history that's still alive, but especially at that time, that, that, that you can, date, that you can um, run backwards across the Phoenicians, uh, uh, the Gallic, of the, um, uh, the, the Arabic, the reconquest period, they're still all alive. And Fridu Cadernes is essentially arguing, why can't we draw on all of these uh, as opposed to um, uh, still seeking a dogma of a, of a new, new age? He coins the, the, the idea of post-modern, um, uh, eventually ends up in New York and then um, in Colombia and then um, in South America as well. Um, that is to, some, to a large degree dropped. I mean, it certainly doesn't enter architecture. Uh, until the 1970s. And uh, Iha Hassan is also a literature professor, and Francois Lyotard slowly but surely integrate that into, into, into what we, as architects, find as a sort of uh, art uh, pervading sort of culture of adopting ideas and then turning them into an architectural language. So for Iha Hassan, it's a total failure of the understanding of postmodernity. And But you might ask the question why is it as architects? Uh, or, um, you know, I say, they're the art historians here, that we, um, we um, architecture historians, we tend to conflate these with an architectural language, a visual language, and, and fix that. When he had son essentially say, we are at, and Francois Lyotard essentially say, essentially say, there is no, uh, should be no fixed architectural language to this. Indeed, if we look at Charles Jenks's book on, on the language of postmodern architecture, before it was published, it went to the editor as the new radicalists, yeah, new radicalism. It wasn't titled The Language of Postmodernity. And his poster boy was Gaudi. Lots of people who are away from the definition of the, of the sort of uh, 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 accepted um, uh, canons. But his editor changed it and said, actually, you know, the, the current buzzword is postmodernity. And eventually, uh, those publications were fixed as an architectural language. You have to ask the question, why? Why do we, why do we get so trapped in this? Um, and my suge suggestion is that it's all the fault of Johan Winkelmann. Now, he's an Enlightenment period. He's a proto-academic. He's really a, a paid librarian. So you're very wealthy. You've got yourself a library. You can show off to your friends. But Winkelmann's coming in to sort it out, get the latest publications, but also study and show that you're interested in what this library has to say. He's then paid to do various journeys on the grand tour. His book, the um, the 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 the, the, um, uh, the uh, art and architecture of the ancients, essentially supersedes Vasari. So Vasari, Giorgio Vasari, two hundred years before, sixteenth century, mid sixteenth century, publishes the most excellent artists, sculptors, and architects. The difference between the two is that Giorgio Vasari is listing each one. Uh, according to the, what he decides, what he describes or defines as their manner. Each one has an idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic manner. They were plucked as 10 year olds, turned into apprentices for a particular artist, sculptor, or architect. And each one became most excellent at it. They graduated as masters, they also taught uh, and had their idiosyncratic style as it were. So his battle at the time, even in the 16th century, was that he could see there was a collective now for style. And there was a battle with him and other art historians, because they weren't really officially art historians as we understand them today, was that um, there shouldn't be a collective noun for a whole period or a uh, whole community of architects. They all have their individual manners. Winkelmann, and the reason that Vasari is so, so uh, um, 
forceful in this argument is that he is also a trained artist, sculptor, architect. So he understands that this stuff happens with our hands. We become excellent at it and innovate with it. So uh, and while Winkelmann, the proto-academic, has never touched anything, he's never sculpted, he's never painted. And of course, we quickly, we quickly find that his assumptions of the Greek, his, best, his book is a bestseller, the next book is a conflation of politics as a work art, and he's essentially saying, in his opinion, Greek is best. Greek is a democratic. The white marbles, the white, the white sculptures, uh, the white um, edifices that are left are emblematic of a pure democratic republican if you like, uh, community. We know that's wrong, of course. I mean, they quickly found out it was wrong, but nevertheless, the strap line which was, if we're ever going to be as good as the Greeks, we have to build like the Greeks. That, that's essentially start, starts off the um, neoclassical age. Stuck, stuck for 100 odd years, uh, especially through uh, uh, um, um, Schinkel's period, and then slowly had to be overturned by a new generation, by, uh, by um, Ruski and Morris and others. But the method, the teaching method, why are we still stuck with conflating visual styles? Uh, politics, if you like, uh, uh, and collective nouns, it's because the education system hasn't changed. We, we, we made a decision, principally in this country, in about 1790, that all architects cannot be master builders anymore. They must be trained in, 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 as apprentices in practice. So you sit there, and you learn the orders, the neoclassical orders. You have, in fact, you're banned. If you want to um, learn how to cut stone, understand where stone comes from, how it's uh, connected with timber or wrought iron or any other materials uh, the age the new age is bringing up you are banned from becoming an architect it's illegal for you to be titled an architect you have to do it through the drawing system the drawing system alone and that hasn't really changed so some schools are slowly trying to pull those pull the understanding of material technology so that's really what it's about understanding the material the properties of materials their technologies and how you assemble them That's effectively me, me reiterating how why why Winkelmann was wrong, um, and then obviously later in nineteenth century uh, oh. understandings of how even Greek temples, are, although they're abstracted stone, have their origins in um, in the architectonic. So you'll know Senate, of course, and his teacher uh, Arend, and he 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 overlaps mm -hmm. the Homo father and um, uh, uh, animal laborants. So um, I, I think. You know, we could argue that Hannah Arendt is of a generation, her, her teachers of a generation where they're still feeling the industrial age, uh, while uh, Senate is much more thinking that actually working and earning a living from work can overlap with, um, with your social purpose. And his argument is that your, what, is, what purpose is your skill? You might become a highly skilled architect, surgeon, whatever craftsman. His definition of craftsman is basically 10,000 hours of training, whatever that's computer programming, surgery, or architecture. But to what purpose? Um, uh, you must have a social, you must have an arm, your hand, a tiller, an ethical tiller. Um, uh, he doesn't answer that. He's just asking, surely, surely we, we ought to do that. Um, the title of this half is really from Pretenderers. You know, people ask, we ask, even in you know, the post, the post uh, modern age, uh, it's, it's the same question that Protagoras asked uh, around about 450 BC. So today we, we would call him the first relativist, essentially saying there are no fixed rules. He starts off as a, a teacher of natural sciences and found that his students fix his ideas. And his argument is that, no, I'm telling you how I've observed my observations. Uh, uh, they're not fixed. You ought to challenge them. And we ought to negotiate them. And if we say there's no change to them, fine. But every year, every few years, we ought to challenge them continuously. So there's no fixed um, agreement. Uh, they, they have to be renegotiated on a regular basis. But what are those um, negotiations? It looks like I'm jumping straight to a project. Well, today, what are they? What are they amongst um, the building traders, if you like, what, we, what some of us will, will end up building and working in? Uh, well, we could all agree that a building shouldn't you know, hand over the keys to your client, shouldn't fall on their heads. It's very straightforward. It's got structural integrity. Mustn't burst into flames. You know? Mustn't cost bankrupt them. 
And uh, I don't know what it's like here, but you know, certainly when I was taught in the first term of the first year, art history was still telling us lovely apocryphal tales of um, Frank Lloyd Wright walking into his clients' houses and raining on their dining table. And isn't this very funny because Frank Lloyd Wright saying, uh, it's a bespoke house, you've paid up some money, all bespoke houses leak. And we're slowly trained to think, well, money doesn't matter. In fact, how many schools of architecture teach you the language of your clients? The language of your clients is money. It's not because they've got plenty of it coming out of their pockets. They have to borrow it. It isn't actually that complex. Uh, and the way I tell students uh, or encourage them to, 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 to uh, take it as seriously as Embody Carbon and uh, other, other criteria is to, to look at some projects we've done where we're working for affordable housing providers. <coughs> And you find that actually, if you assemble your building in a particular way, you save about 20, 25% of the construction costs. It does mean they have to make some compromises. Barrett's Grove is a sort of example. Um, but that saving essentially means that if they're providing housing for people who don't have any, some of them on the street, every fourth building, they get a fifth one for free. Yeah, compared to the conventional way that the point is that they are project managers telling them to carry on building. And then they get it. Um, I'm jumping it straight into a project, but I might need, uh, ideally I should jump into um, EN 15978. Um, but never mind, I'll, I'll jump into this project, which is one of the examples where we've stripped it back. Um, I'll see if I can find, uh, essentially telling the client, uh, if you, if you keep the project as simple as possible, the construction of this project as simple as possible, it's just a cross-laminated superstructure of floors, walls, and roof. Insulation, super insulation on the outside, a cavity, and a brick skin. The brick skin, as all of us know, is, is today just a rain screen. It's not providing structure, is it? But we forget that bricks can hold themselves up. Bricks can hold themselves up. They don't need special engineering, six stories as a half brick wall, as a brick rain screen, well, it doesn't mean it needs to be solid pretending to be structural. It can have gaps in it, so it becomes a ventilated rain screen. The purpose of the ventilation, you might sell it to your client that you've reduced the amount of bricks by 15%, they pay less, but actually you're also stopping, uh, uh, you're allowing that ventilation to stop heat transfer back into the building. Holding itself up means that the superstructure is about 30% lighter because it's not holding up every floor. Pretty much every building you look at, every building is, is holding up with shelf angles, the brick from floor to floor to floor, which means the superstructure has to be heavier. It's crazy, isn't it? Why, why would anybody do that? Well, it's just habit. These things are just habit that, that develop and stick with us over time. And similarly on the interior, once you've got timber interior, this is the superstructure because you want your thermal envelope on the outside as well. Um, why are you covering it with aluminium battens and, um, and plasterboard and then having to skin coat it and paint it and put all the other paraphernalia around it? Can't you just live with it as long as it's got a fire and you clear, clear coat on it? Obviously with fire uh, requirements today, it's about height as well. Altogether, that reduces construction costs by 20, 25%. It's not that hard. This stuff is not that hard. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to make you do this. Can, can you jump to the other one? Feel free to ask questions. No, no one? <laughs> Wait till the end. Uh, uh, it's the other, it's the presentation you already had up, I think. Which one's that? It's on the other back. Sorry, uh, it's entirely my fault. I hold my hand up, being lazy, I could have stitched this together before I came, but I didn't. Oh, right, there we go, straight to EN15978. Um, so EN15978 is the sort of globally agreed measure of a building's embodied carbon across its lifespan. At the top, you'll see section A, which is materials and their construction. Uh, section B in blue is operational carbon, i.e. during its lifetime, how, how much energy you're burning uh, 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 to, to heat, cool, and light it, et cetera. And then section C in yellow is um, reuse. <coughs> what you see below that in, in a sort of, maybe it's on the next slide, right? Uh, what you see below that is, um, 
sort of traffic light system. So this is from the BSRIA and University of Bath Inventory of Carbon and Energy. We've taken them, some of their materials for, for this specific project, uh, but they're, they're listed alphabetically and they tend to be kilogram per kilogram, so either kilogram of CO2 per kilogram of material, which is not much use as architects, not much use for us, because if you're building, uh, creating a CAD model, a BIM model, you can certainly press a button and give you volumes, it's not gonna give you kilograms. Uh, so it's not difficult to obviously convert that into volumes. Then the CAD model will give you the, the volumes. We put that in a sort of uh, traffic light system as in the worst performing materials in terms of carbon, polyester powder coated aluminium. Aluminium is heavy enough. Then you polyester powder coated in an oven, it gets even heavier. So it's 36 tons, I think, a cubic meter at the top. And then hardwood, when you assume the sequestration um, um, at the bottom there, minus a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Um, that's easy enough then for the model to plug into and quickly give you the total. And if we did it conventionally, a steel frame, a concrete frame, obviously the whole thing would be positive. But if we do the thought experiments I was supposing, now we've got this traffic light system, like walking around the supermarket, instead of filling our basket with all the red stuff, the yellow stuff, lots of fatty stuff and sugars and alcohol, cigars and cigarettes. Um, yeah, we're not gonna make it very far. But actually, we mix it up a bit with the green. And sure, we can have some fried lardons and sprinkle our salad with it from the red. We'll probably still end up being negative. So on Bleeding Heart Yard, I'm not going to dwell on the project too much. Um, it's essentially the 1960s demolition of eight buildings that spanned uh, about 200 years. Uh, we, we, um, we doubled the area of it. Um, the, retaining the concrete frame by using cross laminated timber, uh, glue lamb, etc., and then super insulating the outside, yet still using, um, in the end, a sort of brass, a polyester powder coated skin, a perforated skin, sort of 50 50 perforated and solid. Uh, there you get the feel for it's essentially what we today is, you know, call retrofit. Uh, I thought I was going to give you the total there. It still ended up being negative, despite using about three cubic meters of polyester powder coated aluminium. It's the volume of, um, of timber we used to, to extend and made it, made it negative. Unfortunately, we're pushing on the renewals. We didn't have enough renewables, but we didn't have enough room on site for boreholes to drive that down. But it's still lower than the Letty target. Um, now, we were working on a couple of stone projects, which was just simply, you'll know what this is, a reciprocal loaded staircase. Yeah, so that's just one stone resting on another. The price of Myers only rediscovered how this works in the late 1980s, I think. Uh, we'd sort of forgotten. We're always using steel and concrete. Um, so we played with this, realized well, it's, it's, it's ancient technology, rediscovering stone. And while we we're working with stonemasons, seeing these giant blocks arrive in the, in the yard, and thinking, well, how come when we clad, when we talk about stone buildings, we do all this. Surely the other method, just a block old method, is, um, is, uh, is more efficient, surely cheaper, quicker, and so on and so forth. Nobody knew. It turns out for three generations in this country, we haven't worked with load bearing stone. Quantity surveyor said it must be expensive. Well, what was the last project you worked on? I haven't, I've never, but it must be, okay? Uh, same with the structural engineer. So we had to call in a French stone mason because they still teach them a dimension stone in France, not here. We said, well, of course, don't be stupid. You know, the, the, the period of stone construction is millennia long. The period of untested steel and concrete is this on the spectrum. Of course you can. Of course, it turned out to be cheaper doing it in solid stone than uh, uh, a steel frame clad in concrete. Sorry, <laughs> clad, in, um, clad in stone. Um, there's our... There's our Boss, our reverse boss detail as well that, that picks up the um, picks up the floor oh, slab, which is essentially an exoskeleton well, holding up uh, the floor slab. So it's loose fit, yes. entirely open plan. Yes. You're able to have uh, multiple uh, internal layouts uh, um, and you know, change the use over time. Oh, okay. uh, what we learnt on on that project was uh, uh, why, why have we um, it took us about six months 
to do what's effectively a concrete slab on temporary props before the stone came up. And during that period, we, we worked on three CLT projects. Each one of those went up in eight days. Yeah. It's a, it's a bit stupid of us, isn't it? Um, so the next project, cross-laminated timber floor plates and an excess skeleton of stone. These, these were conceived 12 and 10 years ago. What we've learned since is um, why were you making out of big blocks of stone? You can make out of smaller blocks of stone and tie them together. So you have um, pre-tensioned pre, pre stone beams and columns. There we go. So the top, top left, you can see there, this is a, a control sample for a site that's coming to completion soon. Is a control on the top there of a pre-stressed uh, floor plate where we left the underside uh, rough, as the client wants to see that rough underside. Um, essentially just one block after another drilled, a rod put through, tightened and ground pumped in. Um, then directly above my head, acting as a sort of lintel, is actually a short beam. Now the floor plates are about 14 meters long, in reality, and the beams are about up to sort of 12 meters long, and so they vary in, in, in length. And then a conventional twin wall system, so tied together, and then just methods of stacking. Uh, so did I say left hand side, right hand side? Mm -hmm. And then um, on the left down here, is the same pre-tensioned um, uh, uh, technology except in arches. Now, there's two stonemasons working on this project. One team likes to have their, their, um, their men on site working with temporary form work, stacking it all. The other team likes to pre-tension all these elements in the yard, bring them on a lorry, just lift them in place. We thought well, this would be on temporary form work or the arches would be on temporary form work. Actually, they're all prefabricated and, and then just dropped into place. What you see on the bottom left is um, a, a vault section, which is 50-50 stone that's broken across a piece of formwork, two-dimensional bit of formwork, just broken up. And on the back of it, a mesh and then a basalt cement to just bind it all together. So it's lifted up and then just dropped into place. Ultimately, this has got about three meters of soil then thrown back on top. Okay, so these are just technologies in, in, um, in stone. Why stone? Because you probably saw on that traffic light system, you've got carbon sequestrating um, timbers and biomass materials, and then you've got stone. Stone, um, this is, a, I think I can't remember how long this is, 14 meters. Uh, we took this one to fire test. We just couldn't find an oven big enough in this country, but we actually had to slice it in half and put it in an oven in Paris, equivalent of their BRE. And it outlasted, um, outlasted uh, the equivalent concrete and steel because obviously the, the rods are in the middle of the stone. So it's spalling on the outside, but unlike uh, concrete where it spalls, you've only got millimeters, haven't you? Before the concrete spalls and reveals the reinforcement and then it fails, um, uh, the, the, the rods are, are well, basically, we went to about three hours instead of uh, two hours and we turned the oven off. We've been asked to look at, a, for Canary Wharf, to look at a, can you build 30, 35 stories? We didn't know at the time. So we did this with structural engineers, sustainability engineers, m and &E engineers and cost consultants. And what you'll find is uh, um, on the far left, scenario one, where everything is stone. Stone exoskeleton, stone core, and there's pre-stressed stone floor slabs. Obviously, it's still carbon positive, but dramatically less than a steel frame, which is scenario three or concrete frame. But the mixture of putting um, a, a CLT or DLT floor slabs and internal fit out with the stone exoskeleton instead of pre stressed slabs, pre stressed stone slabs, is then carbon negative. Carbon negative, we have to remember, can only exist if you have material passport, i.e., the day you demolish, this material is not being burnt for fuel. Uh, or send it to landfill, but it's actually being reused. No one's demolished a cross laminated timber or DLT building before, but you asked, we asked the suppliers of those, the day that we come to demolish one, would you actually take that material back? Would you buy it back? And so if it was being demolished, I'm happily, happy to take it back, inspect it like we do with steel, and then decide what it's going to be reused for, tall buildings, smaller buildings, if it needs some snipping here and there. Sorry, this is a cost comparison. 
So you can see there, the stone and timber one is cheapest of all. Um, I mean, it's not a vast amount cheaper, but if you're Canary Wharf, it's fairly significant. Okay, I think that's, um, otherwise I'm just repeating myself. Uh -huh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, you thought you were going to be released then, didn't you? Um, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm going to bore you for a bit more. Okay. So about a year ago, I was presenting um, Weber um, Sterling shortlist people on stage. And it, uh, you know, the audience, uh, you know, Q&As at the end of this thing tend to be a bit slow. So you kick it off and I ask them, everything is brick. Everyone's using brick. Do you know the embodied carbon of brick and the embodied, uh, embodied carbon of the building? Of course, answers were no. Um, why using brick? Well, uh, they knew where I was heading because they, they think, oh, I mean, it's going to tell us to make everything in stone. Uh, and some of the answers that came back included things like the native British population doesn't understand stone, but they understand brick. Uh, we're thinking of using recycled toilet paper bricks. You know, weird answers, strange answers, really, in the context of things. Uh, 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 and, you know, let's not dwell on We've got other things to dwell on. Um, so I asked some, some quarries. Um, this is, you know, less, about a year ago, less than a year ago. Uh, one quarry, um, if I asked you to cut stone into brick, standard brick sizes, how much would you charge for it? Because obviously the body carbon of, um, of stone compared to a fired clay brick is a lot less. It's about 98%, 98%, 97 less. Yeah. Turns out it's the same price. So in the last year, that's 10 quarries have just stepped forward. I've sort of got bored of phoning them and asking them. They've stepped forward. Do you know why? Because in this country, we use 2 billion bricks a year. Yeah. Um, that's an industry worth about 8 billion pounds. <coughs> they all suddenly want to get in on Oh, 8 billion pounds. We can get in, in on that. And the embodied carbon, the price is the same, but the embodied carbon is about 97% less. So why would you ever specify a five blade brick again? <coughs> uh, so, you know, the, these are the sort of things that... Um, uh, you know, say, frustrate, um, humble us, and you, and it relates to that first half. Why don't we know that? Well, because we don't have an education system that I'm not asking us to all go to quarries from day one as 10 year old apprentices, but we need to learn the materials, their, their properties, their technologies. And had we known, should, had we been taught, We'd be out in the, um, in, in the construction sector ensuring our buildings are from day one conceived in um, the lowest body of materials possible. <clears throat> Every day in the, in the journals, you will see people's buildings going up, um, having planning approval for 800 homes, whatever it is, yeah. tall, small, um, giant master plans. And we thought, well, this is highly frustrating because all of them are brick, brick, brick concrete frames, steel frames, et cetera. Uh, let's have a, a, run a run an exercise with, with a bunch of students on, um, on the conventional way of building, how they build. I didn't want to name any of these architects, but you know, we know them personally. And they tell us constantly, well, we've got no agency. Uh, it's quantity surveyors and project managers and contractors who make decisions on these things. Um, so, well, the reality, the reason you don't have the agency is because you don't know the materials. You don't know the cost. You don't know any suppliers. If you know these materials and you know these suppliers, you will be able to assemble these and hand them over as a, as, a, as a package to a contractor and say, this will be on budget and it will be low in some body carbon. So we take some of these typical schemes and of course there could be immediate carbon reductions, some of them into negative, depending on what materials you're using. So even foundations, so we're working with structural engineers and stone suppliers at the moment, where we've at least so, sorted the problem of single or double basement in stone instead of concrete. Conti Surveyor said that's, that's cheaper than pouring concrete because the stone is fair faced on the, on, on the interior, not having to, to, to add extra layers. The slab on our first attempt, uh, we couldn't get through because we couldn't get that warranted. The slab was still made out of pieces of stone that were moving. And to get it warranted, it must not move. Hence, you pour concrete with reinforcement. Of course, what we've discovered since, again, it's one of those dirt moments because we're working on these pre-stressed floor plates, which are just next to one another. Had we drilled holes in that direction and passed a rod through, tightened it, that would be a floor plate that's not going anywhere. 
drop that to basement, suddenly you have a slab that's replaced in reinforced concrete as well. And then you get your warranties on, on waterproofing as well as insulation. So slowly but surely we're learning um, how to, how to um, replace these, uh, these materials and technologies. And this is really simply saying you could be a stone frame instead of a concrete or steel frame. Uh, uh, for offices, you can have timber beams, joists with stone floor slabs. I'll give you a cold ceiling once you run a loop across and ground source or aquifer to help that cooling and, and heating. Uh, stone bricks, um, in some conditions where you're allowed to, or the fire criteria go up in a, in, a, in a CLT glue lamp system. There are buildings in London now going up to 15 floors in that. You have to, once you're at that height, you have to encapsulate some of that floor plate, about 45% per floor, in plasterboard still. But essentially telling you it's all possible. And dare I say, you know, if I, if I pushed it, um, um, if I pushed it, I, I, would, I would suggest that the more we build, the more CO2 you take out of the atmosphere, build more to save the planet as opposed to degrowth and build less. But I guess that's helpful. Thank you.